network connectivity. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about all the ways we connect back to the internet, which is always the fun part of networks, right? So the oldest, slowest, worst way of connecting to the internet is dial-up networking. When we do this, we use a phone line. It's analog, so it makes noises, right? The maximum speed you can get on this, because of the way phone lines are built and the analog connection, is 56 kilobits per second. Okay, um, that is really, really, really slow. You don't want to be operating at that. Uh, to do this, you have to have a modem. This can be either built in, it can be done as an expansion card, it can be done externally through USB or serial, like this old serial modem. On a laptop, it was done through PC cards. It can be integrated into your motherboard. Uh, you can use a mini PCI or mini PCIe laptop card. Um, and again, you're going to need a dial-up ISP because when you make that phone call, somebody's got to answer and put you on the internet. Uh, back in the day, the most popular one was obviously AOL, America Online. We also had CompuServe. Uh, we had Net Zero, all sorts of companies in that business, most of which have switched their business model because it's really hard nowadays to find the dial-up network provider. Um, there are a few still out there for people who live in like rural, remote areas that don't have any other options. Uh, but really, it is a bad way of getting online. It is extremely slow. You're not streaming video over this. You're lucky to download email over this nowadays. It is painful. So because DSL was so, excuse me, because uh, dial-up was so slow, uh, they created a digital and faster way of doing this called ISDN, which is Integrated Services Digital Network. It went up to 128 kilobits per second uh, for most users. It was a required ISDN terminal adapter. Essentially, you'd take two or more phone lines, they would bundle them together with this adapter to create faster speeds. There were internal cards and external cards. This is an example of an external car, uh, an external uh, ISDN modem. And you can actually get it as a primary rate interface as up to 1.5 megabits per second, which this technology is 1990s technology. So having that kind of speed was amazing. Now the cost on that was several thousand dollars a month. Okay, so this wasn't for everybody. Um, and then the small businesses, they would have BRI, which was basic rate interface, where they could use either a single or a dual channel and get 64 to 128 kilobits per second. Are you going to see this in the real world? Most of the time, no. Um, I still see this on a daily basis. Uh, one of the places I work, we have an older person in charge that loves his ISDN and refuses to let it go and uses it for our video teleconferencing because he doesn't trust IP video teleconferencing. Kind of silly, um, costing us a bunch of money, but you know, sometimes the boss gets what the boss wants, right? Um, it worked really well for video teleconferencing, but nowadays everybody switched over to IP services, right? Why not have a cable modem or a fiber modem and let it do it at a much faster and higher speed at a much lower cost? So these are pretty much going away. Um, you will be very rare if you actually see one of these in real life. DSL. Uh, DSL was really popular in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Essentially, it piggybacked on a regular phone line using digital signals. So you would use the analog portion of the phone for your voice, and then above and below that, it would use higher and lower frequencies to be able to go online with and do data. We had two types. We had synchronous and asynchronous. Asynchronous meaning not the same. So it would download at a faster speed than it would upload. So as you can see here, um, they would go anywhere between 384 kilobits all the way up to 24 megabits per second. And the upload speed was somewhere usually around 1, 2, or 3 megabits per second. This was good for home users and small businesses. Um, there also had a thing called synchronous DSL, where you could have the same upload and download speed that was used in commercial scenarios, especially for things like replacing video teleconferencing suites. So when you wanted to replace ISDN, you'd go to a synchronous DSL solution. So cable internet. After DSL started coming out, the cable provider said, hey, we need to get on this internet bandwagon too. And so they started using cable modems as a way to send the data to your house. And it ran over coaxial cable like cable TV. If you have Comcast, this is what you have, right? Um, back in the day, you were lucky to get about a 1 to a 5 megabit per second connection as a download speed over cable. Nowadays, they go up to 50 and even up to 150 megabits per second. The upload was significantly slower, 1 to 5 megabits per second. Um, I actually had one of the first cable modems back in 1998. Uh, there's a service called Roadrunner that eventually got bought out by Time Warner. 
And back then, they hadn't figured out how to do uploads yet. So you downloaded through your cable modem, but you uploaded over a dial-up modem. So when you went to google.com, it went up your dial-up, and then you would download all the data you were gonna get, which worked fairly well because most of the stuff you were doing online was downloading content, right? You think about what you guys do nowadays. You go to YouTube, that takes a little bit of text to send to YouTube, and then you get back gigabytes of video, right? Um, so most of what you're doing is downloading and consuming. So that worked really well. And then they figured out the upload part, and now they do both, upload and download through the cable modem. You don't need dial-up anymore, obviously. It's very popular all around the country. Gives you very fast service. The downside is you have bandwidth sharing with other users. So if you're in an apartment complex and everyone comes home at 5 o'clock at night, your internet speed drops significantly. If you're up at 3 in the morning, you're getting really fast speeds. You don't have that same problem with DSL. You don't have that same problem with fiber. But again, cable internet's much faster than DSL, so it's still better overall. The next way you can get your internet is over satellite. And most of us are not going to use satellite internet. The reason why is it's fairly costly. Uh, you basically download your data over the satellite link. Um, originally, it was like that cable modem I described. You'd upload over a phone line and download over satellite. Nowadays, you can do both uploads and downloads over satellites. It's slower than cable, but it's faster than dial-up. It's about the speed of like a DSL connection. The reason why you might use this is if you're in a rural area. So you got grandma's farm out in the middle of some place that doesn't have DSL or cable, and her option is either satellite or dial-up, right? So you would go satellite in that case. Uh, when I say it's more costly, generally it's going to run you about $100 a month. The other thing to worry about with satellite internet is they have, they have very low caps on data. So usually it's something like 10 gigabytes per month. And if you're streaming video, you'll go through a gigabyte an hour, right? So 10 gigs is about 10 hours, maybe on low definition, maybe 30 hours of video. So this isn't going to be good to be used as a Netflix thing, but if you just want to get online at a decent speed and do some Facebook checking, uh, satellite internet can be an option if you have no other options. The other place you'll see satellite internet used a lot is ships. So if you have a client who happens to have a big boat, also known as a yacht, um, they may want to take their internet with them. You can install a satellite, it wouldn't look like this, it's a different type, uh, that actually has a motorized mount and will track the satellite when you're out to sea. Um, KVH makes a really nice product for that. I've used those a lot of times because I've done a lot of work with the Navy as well as a lot of, um, of partner nations and helping them get satellites on board their ships. And we use that exclusively because you can't tie a fiber line to the back of a ship. Right? You got to have satellite wireless internet. <laughs> uh, cellular internet. So we all have this in our pocket right now. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? That's cellular internet. Um, you have to have a cellular modem. Your phone has a modem built into it already. You can have this as internal USB or Wi-Fi. So my laptop, for instance, doesn't have a cellular internet on it. But I can hook up a thumb drive. It looks like a thumb drive. It's a USB cellular modem and I can then have access wherever I am using that cellular modem. These can operate at 2G, 3G, 4G, or even LTE speeds, which is what we use nowadays, which go up to 100 megabits per second. So these are fast connections. The big problem with cellular modems is what? Data caps, right? Again, most of your cell providers are going to give you a data cap of 2 or 3 gigabytes per month, um, which again, if you're going to do a lot of streaming video, it's going to go away real quick. Some providers still have the unlimited out there. They're few and far between. Uh, some of them do where they'll give you full speed until you hit your cap and then drop your speed. Um, like my provider, we get LTE up to the first three gigabytes and then they drop us down to 3G speeds after that for the rest of the month without an additional cost. So I go from having 100 megabits per second to around one megabit per second. But again, that's still sufficient for my uses, so it's okay. Um, and some of your smartphones can actually be turned into a cellular modem for your computer by using tethering. Some companies charge extra money for this, some of them don't. Um, it just depends on your model of phone if it supports it and if your provider supports it. Fiber optic internet, the good stuff. This is what I love. Um, there's a couple out there that are providing this right now. Um, Uverse from AT&T if it's in your area. Fios for uh, Verizon is really great. I know we have it in our area here. And then Google Glass is getting into this business as well, starting in Kansas. Um, and the speeds here are going to be between 3 and 150 megabits per second. With Google Glass, they're looking at 1,000 megabits per second. They're looking at 1 gigabit service to the house. 
and people look shocked at me for this, um, but I just moved here from Japan two years ago, and in my house we had two levels of service you could get, 100 megabits per second or one gigabit per second. Those were the two speeds that they offered from the, from the company because everything there was fiber optic to the house. It's phenomenal service. Very fast, great service. You get the same uploads as you do downloads, and you get that long distance, good secure communication at very high speeds. If you have Verizon Fios in your area or you have Google Glass in your area or another fiber optic provider, highly recommend it. It's great service. Another solution out there is called WiMAX. And WiMAX is the worldwide interoperability for microwave access. So we talked about microwave operating at that 2.4 gigahertz uh, range. Um, and again, this can get you 4G speed sent by microwave. Um, back where I'm from in Florida, we had a company called Clearwire that did this for a while. They were bought up by Sprint and then Sprint shut them down. Um, but people loved them. Basically, it's a fixed wireless solution. You get a wireless access point that looks like your modem, uh, your wireless access point at home and it had three antennas, and you'd put it by a window, and if you were in the coverage zone, you would get speeds of up to about 20 or 30 megabits per second. Very good speeds, and they only charge about $50 a month. The nice thing that a lot of people liked is that if you went on vacation, you could take it with you if you still were in a coverage area, right? Um, and this will allow you to, to get 4G speeds sent by microwave. That company is no longer in business. Um, now the WiMAX solutions you'll see out there are pretty much business to business environments trying to link together different buildings across campuses. You're not really going to see WiMAX as a good solution for internet for you um, at this, this day and age. Most things now are going either to cable or fiber optic at this point. So when we want to connect ourselves to the internet, how do we do it? Well, you have the simple way and the hard way. And even the hard way is not that hard. So the simple way is what I have here on top. You have a single computer that connects to a modem that then dials into the internet whether it's over fiber, whether it's over dial-up, or whether it's over um, uh, coaxial cable for, for cable. So whatever your internet access device is, you just connect one computer to it and off it goes. Now, if you want to do it and have multiple computers do it, like you do at your house because you have a wife and a couple of kids or something like that, you have to hook all those computers up to a switch and a router, and then that router goes to the modem and that then goes out because the router will serve as the way to do that port address translation we talked about and share that one internet connection across all of those clients. So here we, we talk about again, we have our network address translation, our port forwarding, um, which we talked about previously. Again, we're going to have that router do that internal external switch of private IPs to public IPs and using that port address translation. Uh, DMZ. So the DMZ is what we call the demilitarized zone. And this is where you're going to put things like if you're hosting a server because you don't want people from the outside coming into your network because that would be a security violation or a security risk. Uh, so what we do is we create a DMZ, which is a network, kind of an offshoot of our network that will allow people to come into. So if you're going to run like a Minecraft server out of your house, you would put it into this virtual area called the DMZ. And when people come from the outside to access it, they'll be pushed over into that DMZ without going into your home network. Okay? That's what DMZs are used for. And then we spoke already about MAC filtering. We can use MAC filtering as a way to keep unnecessary, uh, unauthorized people out of our networks. So how do you set up your home network, uh, your small office, home office network? First, you're going to decide on what type of internet connection you want to use. Do you want cable? Do you want DSL? Do you want ISDN? Do you want satellite? Whatever it happens to be. You're going to determine how the network is going to be connected for the users. Are we going to use Cat5 network or Cat5e for wired? Or are we going to use wireless and use wireless N or wireless AC? Next, we're going to select the cable or DSL modem and router to use. Uh, we'll have our ISP install the cable or DSL modem, uh, or we'll use a self-install kit. At that point, we have a connection to the house. Now we'll connect that into our router. Then we'll connect our router into our switch or our access point, and we'll be able to configure each client to access that router and make sure they're part of the same work group. At this point, we can set up file sharing or printing, print sharing if we want to, to share resources among our office. And then we're going to test the internet connection from each client. Why is it important to do it from each client? Because just because the connection to the building's working doesn't mean the connection from Joe's computer and, and uh, Chuck's computer and Dave's computer is working. So we'll go around and make sure it works from everybody. And then we'll also make sure that they have the ability to access shared resources internally, like the printers or the file shares. That's the basics of how we would set up a small office, home office network. 
So which of the following network devices uses NATs to convert our private IP space into public IP addresses? Is it a NAS, a hub, a firewall, or a bridge? So for this, we're going to end up using a firewall. Okay? The other thing we can use for this is a router. Most routers have a firewall built into them, especially in the small office, home office environment. Um, so I just want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Routers and firewalls both can do this NAT translation for you.